Welcome to this edition of Thought to Action, presented by the Herb Lennon Center for Policy Research. I'm Chris Cordani. If you enjoy our content, don't forget to hit that like button. Also, comment, share, and subscribe to enjoy sneak previews of our videos, exclusive content, and more special programming in the works. Join our Patreon page, patreon.com slash thought to action. As a subscriber, you'll also have access to our Ask Us Anything sessions, full live streams, and lots of other great things. It's Patreon dot com slash thought to action also follow us on facebook twitter linkedin getter and our website londoncenter.org it didn't take very long for new york's governor kathy hochel and the new york state legislative democratic majority to pass a new round of hefty restrictions on firearms possession and self-defense in the empire state after the supreme court's bruin case decision as a rather quick reaction Hochul's new law asserts state oversight over background checks for firearms and regular checks on license holders for criminal convictions, establishes the formation of a statewide license and ammunition database, strengthens and expands the old no-gun zone laws, informing criminals they can guarantee honest citizens will be unarmed in places which can be primary targets for them, like libraries, buses, and subways, as well as places of worship and entertainment venues, redefining the law relating to the sale of body armor to include hard body armor, restricting a private citizen's ability to obtain such even for self-defense. Our panel is here to discuss. Gentlemen, there are very serious constitutional and public safety concerns with this rapid response from the New York government. What's your take, and what do you think could happen next? Tony? So first, I'm going to kick it over to Tom, Tim real quick because Tim's actually working on some articles. But two things I'm going to bring up. In summary, Hochul is reintroducing infringement. Uh, shall not be infringed. I, I don't know how she keeps missing that, but... She is a, a, a New York progressive, so I guess they have reading comprehension problems. Secondly, one thing I'd like the media at some point to ask is like, Governor Hochul, uh, how many criminals do you expect to comply with, with all these new laws? How many criminals who, are in co who have guns are going to comply with this? And the answer we know is zero. No, nobody will. And I think this is, again, uh, emblematic of the fact that the, the progressive left has committed itself to disarming all law-abiding citizens. There's some deeper roots there, but I think that's my summary. So, Tim, uh, you're working on some articles. Over to you for kind of exploring all this for the purposes of our discussion. Sure, yeah. It was actually surprising to me that they came up. I knew they were going to do a, an emergency session um, to try to figure out what to do with regards to the New York State Rifle and Pistol First Bruin Supreme Court ruling um, I was surprised that it came so quick, and it's you know kind of endemic to what they actually do in Albany and how it works. In that the three day public comment period was somehow again because this is an emergency that needs to be solved right now, even though it doesn't actually go into implementation until September first. Um, we're just going to get rid of the whole public's comment. You know that whole democracy matters thing doesn't really matter when the powers that be don't want it to matter. So that, that's right off the bat. Mm. Some other things that came into this is that, um, before we get into the root itself, is that they use this as kind of a Trojan horse for every other piece of legislation on the, the gun control topic that they wanted to get through as well. For instance, background checks on, on ammo and, and various other um, tidbits that had been up for debate. They're like, all right, well, let's just get this all through. Now that we're going to have an emergency session, let's just get everything done at once. And so wow. there's clearly constitutional issues around that. So let's get into the, the, the bill itself, because the, the, the bill set for, for it's kind of the big buckets there are, are, are setting this vast new requirements for, for you know, licensing and where people can go and so forth. Uh, part of that is that, you know, they set forward all this, let's say, gun control training right? A minimum of 16 hours that somebody will have to take, right? And we can, you know, there can be discussions on whether that's, you know, too long, it'll be too costly. There's at least two hours of live fire that's involved in this. But, you know, the NYPD has worked on eliminating most of the ranges left in the city over the course of many decades. So, so where is that going to happen? So there's all kinds of logistics there. And then once you've actually gone through all this training, you have to then pass a written test, with a minimum of 80% uh, answers correct. And so at this point, and, and, and thorough background checks that don't even go into um, you know, everything that a background check would and more, but then are ongoing on a monthly basis. And so it's a background check that, that literally never ends. Now, wow. and I'll go into a little deeper into that in a, in a moment, but there's also the issue of um, once you've actually gone through this and you're kind of a certified good guy, 
Then you have these, and, and by my count, have 20 categories of places that if you are caught carrying, um, everything from zoos to, to um, uh, mobile vehicles that are owned by a government agency or all kind of litany of things, you're charged with a class E felony, right? Which then, as, as we all know, if you have a felony conviction, you are now disenfranchised from, from exercising your civil rights, from voting, from owning a gun, from all these other things. And, and this is crazy because we've already certified these people through this massive process about being a good guy, right? And so why are we trying to throw people in jail who maybe have, you know, wandered into some place that they didn't realize was a, a temporary polling station or a place where, um, you know, disabled uh, individuals are treated or any number of things like that? That's just crazy. And, and for an entire, you know, state that is discussing and and they and this was this term was co coined in New York deincarceration. I mean, it seems like we're going to be going out and building new prisons here. So did anybody there think this through? Now, of course, also you have a situation where law enforcement, both on duty, off duty, and while retired, are are now exempt from all this. And again, this is all in the context of a state that for for years was gripped with the whole, you know, gripped with protests day and night of, of Black Lives Matter marches, talking about institutional racism, the power of police. And apparently we're gonna maintain police officers, again, when they're on duty, off duty and retired as super citizens, right? And nobody, including um, um, the Senate head, the first female African-American woman, um, uh, Stuart Cousins to have the leadership of the upper chamber. Did anybody of these, uh, any of these folks realize the hypocrisy here, right? And, and then going back to the background checks itself, one of the other interesting uh, components in that is the look at the police will be requesting three years of any social media accounts that you actually have. Yeah, um, I don't know how that's any remotely legal. I, I don't know how that- Exactly, that's the issue. I there, don't know how it's like- Again, so now the police are going to be monitoring social media accounts. Now, I get that we've had, you know, just the, the one recently where you've got some nut jobs doing some, some crazy things and there are some warning signs on social media, right? That's, I get that there's some element uh, of folks that want to try to use that as a way to keep these bad people from getting guns. I get that. But, but you don't also see the civil rights element of, let's say, anybody who's used the term ACAB or defund the police probably isn't going to pass that check right and in even the appeal process too is there is a a, a portion of the law that's laid out for appeal process but but nobody should, says well who's that going to be administrated by and and what's that about is that just going to be another police bureau that does that and again this is a lot of this is going to get sued um a lot of this will fall through. I mean, when you say all of public transportation is, is off limits, how you can make an equal protection argument from a progressive standpoint, I mean, that seems like you've been knocked out in, you know, in 101 on that, of how you're not discriminating against a certain type of people and not the person that can drive around city in their Lexus with a chauffeur. Right. So I think this will get a, a lot of attention to the courts. This will be litigated for you know the next decade. And I think a lot of these will be struck down. But I think what's really interesting here, again, in the backdrop of Black Lives Matter and institutional racism, the power of the police, I think we've basically in New York have have just got given up on that. I mean, that's just Black Lives Matter, I think, is 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 fairly done here, except for, you know, a, a slogan perspective, any of the real issues that it was working on. Um, looking at this legislation and some other pieces with regards to, you know, the overreach, the police, that's done. And even it's funny that, you know, we talk about the issue of um, the bulletproof vests. And again, this, the catalyst for this initially comes back from this tragic shooting that happened in, in, in Buffalo with where some nut job wore a vest. Now we had already on the books had existing legislation that said, if you did something, in that's in, you know, committed a crime with a vest, I think this may go into federal law too, you are actually can face all kinds of other charges. So it was kind of covered, but what wasn't covered, you had a lot of activists. And I'm not saying we should be in a society where people should walk around wearing bulletproof vests. That's crazy. And that's not a place that I, 
want to live in. But you had a lot of black activists, like for instance, Hawk Newsom, who is the leader of Black Lives Matter in, in New York, who would go around wearing a bulletproof vest because of his adamacy that, that police were shooting black people. Now, if he does that again, he's going to jail for, for a felony, right? And, and, the, and it's funny because the law actually goes in and specifically describes how it is, you know, that that, that bullet must be able to pierce certain amount of layers of whatever garment that you're, that, you, that you're wearing. And again, reading this as somebody who is familiar with the Black Lives Matter movement, what they were trying to accomplish and, and the worry about uh, um, innocent people getting shot, to, to read that language is, is incredibly, it, it, it's just very chilling to me from that kind of activist perspective. And then from seeing that, you know, again, the primary sponsor of the bill was, a, you know, a black woman leader, um, it was also passed in the New York State lower house, the assembly, which is also, you know, both chambers of the legislature in New York are, 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 are run by, you know, a black woman and black men. And none of these issues, like, were ever even raised of anybody saying, wait a minute, I think I participated in a bunch of marches on this stuff. Maybe we should at least have a discussion, maybe even open it to the public like we're required to by law and have these discussions, and, and nobody ever did. So that's what's surprising to me and what I think is so interesting about this. Well, the first thing I, I just wanna comment on, again, Tim, not to, to, to beat a dead horse is, someone should ask literally, how many career criminals do you expect to comply with these laws? Because it, it will have zero effect to the group which is most uh, prominent and most likely to use a weapon in, for purposes of a crime. It, it, it'll, have, it'll have zero effect. And this is simply focused on law-abiding citizens. Am, am I wrong on that? No, that, that's absolutely true. I mean, and, and that's why, again, they overstepped and, and, and it's going to wind up biting them in the butt as it did before. I mean, I'm quoting on record, I, I have to pull up the article that I had an article that I published maybe 10 years ago where um, in, a, in some of the local papers where I said, guys, unless you get in and change New York's laws to truly make them common sense, right? Get rid of the discrimination, get rid of the racism, make it so that people can even get gun rights training. I mean, one of the crazy things about this bill is that this is the first bill in New York history that allows people to get gun safety training legally. Think about that. It was wow. a crime to get live fire gun safety training before they actually put a license in your hand. These things, in no way anybody could say is common sense, but this is the, the way it was. So I said to them, listen, you need to change a lot of these things, get a reasonable uh, uh, standard in place so the reasonable people can get licenses. And then that would probably maintain co uh, constitutional muster. But they didn't do it. They made things worse and worse and worse. And just as I mentioned at the time, um, the whole thing came collapsing down. And I imagine you're going to get a Supreme Court ruling that comes in that basically says, nope, you, you, you can't do schools and you can't do schools and you can't do uh, federal buildings or, or something like that or state buildings. And all of this is going to going to come down because, I mean, look, I've read through all 20 categories from A through S and it is to, for I don't think there's anybody out there that can sit and put together a map of, of what that is. And again, some of these uh, locations are mobile locations. So it would change on a day-to-day -day basis as well. So the whole thing's crazy. And it clearly not designed to put criminals in, in jail or stop any of these tragedies. They're designed to put more people in jail, which again, I was under the impression that we were trying to close down Rikers and close down these prisons and not build new ones which apparently is, is not what the, the state assembly, the governor and the state, is, and the state senate have uh, decided to do now. I think you're absolutely right, Tim. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, I'll be uh, relatively brief. Uh, I guess indirectly or directly, uh, my comments are about whack-a-mole, okay, whack-a-mole. So whack-a-mole might be a fun game, but we don't have to play whack-a-mole when we have constitutional rights if we don't want to. If we don't want to. So there's a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to talk about Maryland and then lead into New York. So Maryland, the news today, Governor Hogan directs Maryland State Police to suspend, quote, good and substantial reason standard for wary and care, uh, wary and care carry permits, wear and carry permits. 
Okay, so that's a, you know, not conservative state, not Western state. Here we are in the state of Maryland. It's usually, you know, uh, in league uh, with the state of New York on a, on a lot of these laws. Uh, now you have all the laws uh, that, that you just talked about, Tim, that are happening in New York with Governor Hochul. So I'd like to point out two things in support of some things that I've said earlier about deprivation of rights under color of law. The two things are two federal, the two things are federal uh, criminal statute and a civil, civil statute. So under federal criminal law, and I won't read the whole thing in the interest of time, but people can look it up, 18 USC 241. And my reference point that I'm reading right now is on the FBI.gov website. But you can also find it on the Cornell Law website. 18 USC 241 is conspiracy against rights. You can read that. Second one is 18 USC and the 18, <clears throat> Title 18 is all, you know, federal criminal law. So uh, Title 18 USC 242, deprivation of rights under color of law. Briefly read some sections and I want to go to the uh, civil uh, litigation. This statute makes it a crime for any person uh, acting under color of law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom to willfully deprive or cause to be deprived from any person those rights, privileges, or immunities secured or protected by the Constitution and laws of the U.S. So the Supreme Court has settled this. They've said, hey, look, the Second Amendment is a top-level right, and there it is. So, so now, after this ruling, that surely seems to me like this is a willful, willful uh, deprivation of rights, okay? It goes on to say, and I'll paraphrase here in the third paragraph, acts under color of law includes acts not only done by federal, state, and local officials within the bounds or limits of their lawful authority, but also acts done without and beyond the bounds of their lawful authority. So all these folks took a, a note to the constitution, right? Are they doing these outside of the acts of the lawful authority? The question that I would have is, where is your jurisdiction? The Supreme Court has spoken, where's your jurisdiction to do any of these things? It goes on to say, this definition includes, in addition to law enforcement, Officials, individuals such as mayors, council persons, judges, nursing home proprietors, security guards, et cetera. I would argue that the et cetera also includes governors of the state of New York or otherwise, and all persons who are bound by law, statutes, ordinance, or customs. So, you know, the, the uh, state of New York and New York City in particular, I think still has a sheriff. The sheriff is there to protect the rights under the constitution why can't the sheriff look at that? And then finally, I'll conclude by saying uh, something about uh, civil litigation. So if no one is there to act, okay, you can always start a lawsuit of your own. And 42 U.S. 1983 is a civil action for deprivation of rights. You can go through and read that. It, it talks about uh, things very similar uh, to what I just said in the criminal law, and it makes it a civil action. So, so you have standing under civil liability. So to me, our remedies in the law, let's get these lawyers lined up who want to protect the constitution for the people that can't afford their own lawsuits. A lot of the folks that, that we've talked about, Tim, and, and others have talked about, let them join a class action lawsuit. And let's make these people that are conspiring to deprive many, many people of their constitutional rights liable, civilly liable, for acting under color of law and without actual authority, they're clothed in the garments of law. Hey, I'm the governor, so I say you can do this. And in all of their meetings and all of their reasons why they say, you can't carry a gun here, you can't carry a gun there, you can't carry it on public transportation. To me, that's conspiracy and willful deprivation of rights. So if we take those things and we put them together, I think that uh, you know maybe that's a good way to punch back with the law. Pete, your thoughts on this? Yeah, one, I'll keep this very brief. Uh, just a simple thing. Some touching on uh, on what both Tim and, and uh, Bennett have just said. Think about some of those places where, under these new regulations, these new laws, you're not going to be allowed to take a a, a weapon. And, and they're the places where you know I I uh, I, I'm, I don't I haven't read the the law, but I'm going to give you a 99.9% .9 chance if it's on, on the list, a, a, uh, a home where, or a facility where someone goes to uh, do rehab, uh, you know, someone who is disabled or, or whatever, uh, particularly someone who's disabled, 
uh, I'm sure that he's not allowed to carry a weapon into a rehab center. And the, the fascinating thing about that is the fellow who is going to a rehab center, the, the guy or gal is going to a rehab center, uh, let's say he's a veteran, uh, lost a foot, I'll, I'll use a reference in my head, a, a, a fellow I know, uh, lost a leg, uh, going to a rehab center. Uh, he's not a rich guy. He, he's, he's okay, but he's not a rich guy. And so if he's making his way to the rehab center, probably by way of the, of the subway, uh, he's going to be passing through a series of places where he's not allowed to carry. Uh, he's going to be in a facility where he's not allowed to carry. Uh, he's now placed it under a whole host of restrictions that are going to cost him a good deal of money if he is even going to try and carry in any case. And as, as someone who is disabled, he's just the person who needs, if you will, uh, Sam Colt's uh, uh, solution to all men not being created equal. And, and the, the answer here is, is what you've got is the state has essentially uh, deprived him of his ability to protect himself both financially, they've, they've, they've twisted his arm, and in fact, uh, legally, they've twisted his arm. He can't carry, even if he could get the money together to, to qualify to carry a pistol. Uh, the places where he needs to go are places where he's not allowed to carry it. I mean, it's just, it's just a horrible, horrible set of circumstances. Well, Pete, to that point, this is where the, I, I think it's the 14th Amendment equal uh, protection comes in, because... To me, he deserves equal protection in any facility he may be threatened at, which goes back to our concept of minimum standard response. He should have that right. That should be part of, that is a right, the right of self-defense, and that right should apply anywhere in any environment. And I know Tim has said there's some issues that maybe he would have regarding where that would occur. I'm, a, I'm kind of a purist on this. If you're law-abiding, there should be virtually no areas you should, you should be prohibited from bringing a weapon into as long as you're not brandishing it, you're not being open about it, you're not being antagonistic, there's no reason for you to not, you know, like I was at an event Saturday uh, for the 4th of July. I was armed, nobody even knew. As a matter of fact, I think people, if they, if they looked at me, would have said, there's no way to put a concealed weapon. And that's fine, it, you know, great. But the point is, I was armed, I was, uh, nobody knew, uh, nobody would have even thought because of the way I was dressed. And that's that should be fine. But I was but the weapon was available to me if I so felt the need to respond to a threat. That should be the standard. There are a lot of potential abuses to the whole thing as well. This is absolutely a knee jerk reaction to the Supreme Court's decision. We're going to be talking more about this and following what happens next here at the Thought to Action program brought to you by the Herb Lennon Center for Policy Research. We do thank you for being with us for this edition of our program. Don't forget to hit that big like button if you are watching us or listening to us. Leave a review or a comment on our program. We'd like to hear what you think about this and whatever else we discuss. If you'd like to help us create more discussions of programming like this, please join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash thought to action. And if you are watching on Rumble, hit the subscribe button there. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button there and follow us or subscribe if you're listening to us on any of our various podcast outlets. Also pick up some merch at our Thoughts of Action Teespring store. We'll be adding new items soon. The link to our video is in that description. The links actually are in our video and podcast descriptions. That came out a lot better. For our panel at the Herb Lennon Center for Policy Research, I'm Chris Cordani. Thank you, stay informed, and make your day a great one.